Mina Kurdi from Team Tracifier. Uh, it's a startup uh, mostly in supply chain traceability and communication on part. I'm very glad to have Catherine here from Circular Tree, Marianne, and Pasquale. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a very interesting discussion today. Cool. Pascal, Marianne, maybe you're going to introduce yourself. Um, yeah, I don't know if I need to introduce myself. I was talking before as well. Uh, Mariana, again, um, from the IOTA Foundation, um, part of the regulatory uh, first team of IOTA, which is a layer one protocol. We are based here in Germany, headquarters in Berlin, and um, also uh, part of the board of directors of the International Association for Trusted Blockchain Applications in ADPA, where I also lead the social impact and sustainability working group. Yeah, uh, introduction. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's great. Um, yeah, so my name is Pascal van Knaij from Future of Trust. We're a company that is focusing on using next generation uh, technologies to make a real impact. Um, that, that we do, we talked about it a little earlier. And um, yeah, I, I think, you know, we wanted to kick this off with, with, a, with a very simple question, right? What are currently actually the the problems that we're seeing when it comes to, you know, the supply chain and traceability. I think, Catherine, you touched upon it a lot, you as well, with some of the solutions. But, uh, you know, what are the, yeah, what do you see as the current problems within the space, Catherine, if I may ask you? Yes, yeah, so I'd say from a, um, from a company, from a company perspective, it's, um, it's definitely the the market acceptance kind of kind of stage, um, so the companies are not really uh, ready to to accelerate on on blockchain on the real values of blockchain, um, as they're struggling with so much. Like in my space, uh, definitely with sustainability data, getting getting real data, um, getting data from suppliers. I think it's also a quite new way of of thinking, um, and like the whole data exchange thing um, along the supply chain. I mean. We know companies like the companies such as Procter & Gamble, Unilever, whoever, they became um, big with um, thinking in their silos and now they need to report very, very, um, very, very sensible data um, and, and think in, in ecosystems and not no more in their company only. And the second thing is definitely the, the knowledge topic, I'd say. So um, I'm researching in it, so I'm doing my PhD in, in blockchain for sustainable supply chains. I can really um, tell that nobody is really um, researching in it for some years, several years, and you really need the um, expertise for, for several years for it. Um, so yeah, that's... that's so, so basically you're saying the two things would be the, the, um, uh, the, the, data, the data acquisition data and the other thing would be knowledge, correct? Am I correct in uh, saying that these two things, according to you, are, yep. are an interesting problem to be, be tackled? How about you, Mariana? What are, you, what are your thoughts um, on that? I read that different, though. <laughs> uh, I think that one of the things that she was mentioning is actually uh, adoption. That's why I, like, I think you meant also like the industries are not ready, and it's because we still have like some proof of concepts and pilots, but like actually we need like global adoption if we want to see an uh, impact. And the other thing that I read also, or like if I didn't read it, but like it's one of the things that I, I, I see in the industry is standardization. Because as long as we don't have standardized processes on how we collect the data, how we exchange the data, uh, and how we cooperate, then everyone is also working on silence. That's actually for the blockchain perspective, but like from the supply chain in general, I, I actually think that like we always need to think in what are the problems that are already in society that we are actually trying to tackle. And whether we like it or not, these problems have been there for decades and we have not been able to solve it. So blockchain actually is like offering a solution or like opportunities to solve those issues. And we need to understand is where exactly. So for example, when you talk about like uh, normal reporting, ESG reporting or like supply chains as well, what you'd see is that like the reporting goes isolated. So we need to understand from the moment that you are doing like mineral extractions or raw material extractions until the moment that you actually like do refurbishing or recycle, you need to understand all the impact that you're generated there, not isolated. And not only about like the product or services, you also need to understand what are the carbon emissions of transportation, uh, what are the, like, the carbon emissions of production, what are the energy consumption, what is the water consumption. All of this data actually need to be collected 
and analyze it to understand what is the actual impact of what they're, what they're doing. And we actually have the opportunity to do that uh, by interactions with different projects during the supply chain. But you need a standardization and you need adoption. So that will be my key. My so so standardization and adoptions, and you're also circling back to what, what Catherine is saying, is the, the, da the data, the data aggregation, correct? So, so Mina, just what are your thoughts? Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm exactly like by, uh, by Catherine and Mariana, like f I'm coming mostly from the practical uh, side, talking with so many use cases, um, but we all face the, the same uh, challenges. Um, but how do you see, uh, for example, that, that companies trying you know, to, to come along that, or are there, uh, are there any kind of willingness? Um, is it like has a high priority for them? Not enforcement from the regulatory. Uh, it, this is definitely a, a reason why companies take a step toward that, but rather from their, their innovation part. How, how, how do you see that? Well, I already talked a lot of about examples, but I think that one of the things that we have right now, especially in Europe, is that we have the Horizon 2020 and all the projects that are coming with the European Commission or like funding from the European Commission. And this actually like gives the opportunity to build consortiums that actually can showcase, like as I mentioned, like have like a lighthouse project that showcase how the technology can actually address some of the challenges that we are seeing. If supply chain is a priority, I will say like if it is not that, what it is it? Because like we saw the impact on like the disruption of supply chain with like the COVID-19. We have seen like what is going on like now with the energy with the uh, Ukraine crisis. So all of those things impact the supply chain. And so we need to start to just like make the supply chain more more, more uh, resilient to any kind of alterations. Like we are not even overcoming the first one with the COVID-19 when we were hit by the next one and it's going to happen again. So if we can manage to just like make the supply chain processes more efficient and more like resilient to the different like outside uh, actions that are happening and they can impact them, I think that that's actually like uh, one of the big things that we can do and why actually like the European Union is like putting, putting so much investment in different projects that are working in, 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 this, in this particular area. So, so Catherine, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I'd say um, they are very willing to invest at the first place, but uh, not on scale. So like they're always willing to do any MEPs or yeah, new innovative products, but never on scale, like never buy the solution for a, I don't know, licensing fee for a, a year or something. But it's always like three months and then yeah, let's see what happens. Um, and for example, um, that also plays into the whole knowledge thing I've talked about. Um, one customer asked us after like a year of, of a project together, um, what about the blockchain? Now we have a product carbon footprint and sustainability data, blah, 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 but we don't use a blockchain, do we? And we we're like, um, no, we first solved the sustainability problem. And he was like, well, then I want to have a, a blockchain now. And I was like, I don't know, asking two or three questions and was immediately clearly, um, he was immediately clearly speaking that he doesn't want to have a blockchain. So the whole, yeah, knowledge in between, it was a sustainability guy. And he was not really thinking through security, um, scalable tech things, um, all those challenges. So it's really, I'd say, um, yeah, like the, the market is, is definitely willing or the companies are definitely willing to invest in it, as you can see in all those ecosystems, um, but they're not really ready, I'd say, to, to use it on scale. Um, I need to jump in because I, I highly disagree. Like most of the projects that we have implemented with the with the European Union, at least, these are like not like three months projects. These are like three four years uh, projects. And one of the conditions that they always have or tend to have is the commercial commercialization plan. So one of the things I really like is that like or like. Basically, I have okay for this. Like, you should not rely on grants all the time to do your job. Like, it's good to have it at the beginning to show that it works, but then you need to find a way to also be economically sustainable, and you do it that via commercialization plans. And this is actually what is going to guarantee adoption, because if you are always depending on grants, you are working also with secondary agendas. For those that have implemented projects, you know how difficult it is to report, and that you always have limitations in what you want to do. If you arrive to the solution to a point where you actually can commercialize it, then it's up to you what you do with the solution. 
with the part of the knowledge, I completely agree with you. Like I didn't present this, uh, but one of the things that we did within Atpa last year was like actually trying to understand what were the challenges of blockchain projects when trying to scale uh, and blockchain projects working on sustainability. And one of the things that they mentioned is that they didn't know how to report the impact that they were achieving. And if you're working on sustainability, know how to report is a key component if you want to bring investors. And what we noticed is that like we had like different kind of population with like different knowledge. So one of the things, like the first thing that we did was actually like creating a social impact definition for the blockchain space. So every project working with us could use this definition when approaching impact investors or angel investors that can be interested, not so much on the blockchain part, but actually on the impact part. And the second one was like, I don't know who he has, like here has experience with like ESG reporting, impact reporting. That is a mess. You have like hundreds of models that like normally have paywalls and are really difficult to implement. And I come from the development sector. I was working in like human rights before. So for me, it was like intuitive what you need to do when you do impact reporting. Talk to a developer. Like it's not in intuitive whatsoever as the knowledge that they have is not intuitive for me whatsoever. So we need to find like ways in which we bridge this knowledge so we actually can work together. And that's why I, I was talking about partnerships. Like this is the key topic to actually solve some of like not only knowledge sharings, but like actually like all the other issues that, that we have. Yeah, exactly, so if I just add from, uh, like you're talking about from the IOTA side, it's definitely um, a kind of infrastructure. But if I just jump as a, as a small player in the market, your niche and um, uh, one of the things when, when you're going to, to customers, they're asking us lots of questions. They say, okay, do you have these, that, that? Is it okay if we are not a <laughs> Uh, supermarket, but we, uh, we have one specific uh, expertise, and blockchain is a component, can be used, it cannot be used. Like, blockchain is not necessary. It's like we need to solve your sol um, problem first. Um, and uh, for us, like, it was also a big learning that partnership is a key to win big customers at scale. Um, but I'm also, to be honest, I agree with, uh, with Katrin, kind of, <laughs> sorry. Um, this is the experience all we have made in the market, right? Um, and one key question always come to us is about the ROI. Like companies say, okay, if we implement that, how much we're gonna get back um, and uh, what will happen? Like what's the impact in our customer? Uh, there are like lots of studies uh, on practical and also on, uh, on, on, on theoretical part, like says, um, there, there is like attention of customers in the product, like uh, what's the origin and provenance of the product? How is the impact of the product in, in environment? Um, and um, it's getting more and more important. Like if, even like for us, if, if you give us two similar product, one give more information about, about the provenance one another, like we, I think we unconsciously select the one, like we trust yep. the one with more information. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just lost yeah, so, so, so jumping in on that, obviously, yeah. interestingly, everybody are asks about ROI. What is my yeah. ROI, ROI, exactly. ROI? I like to, again, I talked about it earlier about paradigm, right? So if you look at ROI, we all always think, yeah, what's my return on investment? What, but what about the return on influence, right? <laughs> what about also the return on impact? Yeah. And again, that's where standardization and adaption comes in. But we need to, again, always challenge the status quo. Right, that is one thing. And the other thing, what I hear, and I don't know if you agree with me, a lot of this, you know, um, the supply chain is very journey driven, right? And I think a lot of the companies are so into their data and doing everything just the way that they want to do it, that they're not looking at it from a journey, right? So the way I, I look at that typically is, is if, if you issue anything on the blockchain or anything uh, out there, there's basically three stages. Right. The first stage, I would say, is the pre-issuance of uh, of something. Right. You you look at what it is. The second stage is issuance, and the third stage is post-issuance. So in the pre-issuance stage of, of issuing anything or any piece of data, you know, that can be put on the supply chain, the question that a lot of people seem to forget asking is simply this: Are you who you say you are? Right. From seed to shelf, are you actually this? Are you who you say you are? That is a, such an important question in, in everything we go through in, in designing that journey. And I'm, I'm curious as to what your vision on this whole journey is, right? Because obviously we're all talking about the destination being we need to be standardized, et cetera. And what I've learned in standardization, which I 100% agree, 
right? But there's so many different standards that if I come out and say I am the new standard, everybody goes, yeah, well, F it, right? Uh, that's another protocol, blah, blah, blah. But what if I, or what if we, when I stand next to you and start understanding what your standard is and then try to add that, that standard to, to some of the value drivers, ISO, gold standard, Vera standard, whatever standards is out there when it comes to uh, you know, supply chain. So I'd love your, your thoughts on, on that controversial thinking as to should we really say that we are gonna be the new standard? Should we say there's only one standard or not? Um, yeah, I will say like no. Like I, I also like I'm not sure if I understand like your like three parts of the paradigm. But like what I would say is just like, and it's coming back to what you were saying. Like blockchain is not like the panacea that will solve absolutely everything. Like also those standards not only apply to blockchain projects. Apply when you are trying to do sustainability, and depending of specific use cases, you have like certain kind of standards that are like more suitable for what you're going to say or like you're going to do. So I think that that's like that the thing. Like we need to stop thinking that we can copy paste and then the result is going to be the same and it's going to be good. Like it really depends of like what is the use case? Uh, is it blockchain needed or not? Like you can imagine how many times we get like questions and they just need a database. And, and people need to understand this, but this is also a process of understanding how blockchain works, where are the capabilities, where actually is meaningful to deploy the solution. And then you actually like, need to start thinking like, what was the status quo before? What is the baseline that you are trying to tackle? What are your stakeholders? Like all of these things that I just mentioned that are intuitive for like the development sector uh, or like people deploying projects, but like not so much for like developers with good intentions that want to generate impact. And I think that that's where like the gap is missing. Implementing standards is not easy for anyone. Like not even for us. And we yeah, we are like infrastructure layer, like standards are really heavy, really difficult. You need experts, you need budgets, you need like human resources. So it's like how we actually facilitate that. Like I mentioned it, like one of the things we did was actually creating um simple model for like a small and medium sized uh, blockchain projects that can start to apply certain steps that came from like different models but like all of these different models refer to the same step they call it different and <laughs> you need to pay different uh, fees to access it but like what are the minimum things that you actually need to consider when you are like designing the project, uh, implementing the project, and evaluating the project. So if there is one a standard that is the standard, I don't believe that. I don't think that that's the call. I don't think anyone in this panel is making that call. Uh, I just think that you just need to be really precise of what is it that you wanted to do, what are the resources that you need, and what is what you need to measure. So, so in, in essence, what you're saying is you agree with, with the journey thinking, right? You agree with the fact that we need to understand more or less where, where, th where do things originate and where do things end in, in the whole supply chain. What are, what are your thoughts, Zakitra? So first of all, to the standard thingy, um, I'm always say, uh, saying uh, I'm going to found a company soon um, um, which writes a standard, a standard for standards because it's really <laughs> crazy. It's standards in tech, it's standards in, in sustainability, and I don't want to go deeper into sustainability, environmental sustainability, product carbon footprint <laughs> sustainability. <laughs> Um, so that's that's uh, for sure a huge mess, but I think we do need the standards, and I also don't believe it's going to be like one standard. How should that happen? Um, and to the journey, I, I definitely ag agree that it is a journey, but it's always been. So I think it's not new, also not new that like tech is, is going in cycles, like hype cycles, and then we learn from it. And then a lot of companies and, and use cases fail, it doesn't make any sense anymore. And then um, again, we come to the point uh, where we still want to try, try it out. Um, but I, I think we're in the middle of it and we really, we've already learned a lot and we already came very far. Um, and I think like my whole scalable um, point, I think the market is, is now really mature, um, maturing um, and, and gonna be like scalable in the next few, few years, yeah. I totally agree with this scalability that market also learned uh, like this concept of uh, tr supply chain traceability and, and, and this aspect is in the market since 2015, right? Like to start attempting, attempting until it goes up and down. Uh, but uh, yeah, all of us learned a lot of uh, how to, to, to niche our focus in, in which aspect as, a, as a one part of these all um, um, problem tackler in, in supply chain as, uh, segment, I should say. Um, yeah. And I think it, I mean, we all know it doesn't work without X systems, however you want to call them now, yeah. um, and also without um, regulatory framework. Absolutely. Because I mean, in, in sustainability, uh, CSRD, it's, it's really crazy. Like two years 
um, ago, nobody was really caring about a product carbon footprint of a, of a product. Now CSRD comes and, and everyone's like asking us, do you have a solution for it? Um, so yeah. I, I agree, actually I was wanted to say that when you were talking about scalability and also like with the regulatory framework, is like I don't think I have an example of another industry that have like scaled so fast as blockchain and the DLT industry in terms of like the level of solutions that we have, the maturity of the solutions in the short period of time is still short. Uh, and also like all the regulatory interests that we have, like because this is coming from every place, like every day we get like consultations from national and supranational authorities about like how to regulate this. There is a lot of going on, you mentioned it, like the digital product passport, it's part of the EPSI infrastructure, so there's a lot of going on right now and I think that there is a lot of, inter a lot of interest because they already saw the potential with the, the small uh, uh, POCs and pilots that we have, so now it's actually like the time to act, how we actually scale this to a point where we can actually achieve like global impact. Because supply chain is not just happening in Germany, right? Like, like it's happening everywhere. Like, so if you actually like want to achieve the impact and showcase the potential of blockchain on these solutions, you need to do it at a global scale. So the TLIP project I presented, this is East Africa and UK, but this is two products specifically for this region that are like being like trade with the UK, but like, if we can replicate solutions like this for like different products with different um, jurisdictions, then you have regulatory challenges of how actually like the product actually cross the borders. And then you need to start thinking like, what is actually like the certificates that you need to put in the blockchain? Are they gonna accept it when you arrive? Because I don't do anything doing the project in East Africa, having like beautiful certificates, put it on chain. If I arrive to the UK and say like, what is this? <laughs> like, where is the paper? Where is the signatures? Like they block like the the, the, the merchandise like for, for actually enter. So that like I completely agree. But I think that we are in the right point. And I wouldn't say that we are going as low. Like honestly, like this industry is moving really, really fast. So, so we have indeed a very fast moving industry. I think everybody would agree. And we, we touched upon our, our, our problem set a little bit um, and also in solution. And I and I hear a very big prerequisite, right? which is scalability, right? We, that seems to be one of the biggest uh, prerequisites when it comes to providing solutions into the traceability of this. So we got scalability uh, as a prerequisite. When, when it comes to solutions, I mean, what, 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 what are some of the solutions that you see out there or, or maybe um, want to even create? What, what is your thoughts on that, Mina? Because I know that you're doing something <laughs> with Tracifier, which <laughs> makes it, you know, even the name is very intriguing. <laughs> Yeah, so um, at Tracifier, uh, we definitely also have the vision to, to tackle the whole farm to fork, uh, you know, uh, traceability aspect. But um, again, as said, as a small player in the, in the market, we are trying to be niche and we're looking at our team, uh, what we're good at, the communication. So, and uh, we see also the interest in the market uh, to consume this uh, uh, information grabbed from uh, various other players in the market, for example, how this product has been produced, what's the provenance of the product, and what's the impact of this product in the market. And uh, we're trying, like, at Tracefire, um, uh, making that in a template that can be communicatable with the market. Um, like, it's kind of like gapping, like, the, um, or bridging this gap between customers and companies and enabling companies to, to calm down a little bit and say, okay, uh, we can monetize our solution. It's not about just innovation, but rather about communication. So um, this is what we also found very, uh, very at the point of interest of, of companies uh, so far, and that they really liked uh, at the current time, in the, in the recession time, to focus more that they can increase their sales, create a cut, uh, competitive edge, yeah. I think that we already talked about like the projects, or, like projects that we have, like just to mention one additional, um, as I mentioned, like the part of like the raw material production is really important. There is a project on our um, IOTA community called IOTA Regions, and that's basically what they're doing, but like with like minerals in conflict areas. And this is just one part of the supply chains, right? But if you connect that later with what we are doing with like the, the, like, the uh, DGIT project for sustainability mining, then you actually like, apply uh, um, uh, one of the solutions of TLIP for like actually like the transit of like goods between borders and then at the same time you are like doing uh, DMRB actually like tracking the footprint, you have like an integrated solution that is not implemented by one, 
organization that is like working on a on niche, but actually this, this integration doesn't happen. I don't see why not, <laughs> I would really advocate for it. But this is what I mean, like even though if you have a small players working on niche, you can connect the different solutions if you also have like interoperability among the different solutions, and then you actually can track the whole impact of the supply chain. And this is like the direction where the industry is actually like, moving forward. So this is like, I hope like we see it like not so many years in the future, but like this is actually where I see the potential of like all of these different solutions working right now on silos. But like one of the things that like the whole blockchain industry advocate a lot is interoperability. And now we have like uh, the IBM, so this is like already the first step. I just like hope that we have like those kind of integrations with like different like protocols, so we can just like say, oh, your project actually complements mine. Uh, once the 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 wood or the raw material like move from here to here, and then they can be integrated, and then you have like full traceability. Yeah. So, so w one of the things that that I think, especially within traceability, is, and I, I spoke about it a little bit earlier, is is the problem of authenticity, right? I think that that's been forgotten a lot of times is how do we prove the authenticity of things? Because if you take a market that is, you know, $2.4 trillion on, on counterfeiting, it's the largest criminal enterprise in the world, right? So, tra you know, traceability on the blockchain and, and et cetera is a, in my opinion, a huge thing. And combining authenticity, right, with that traceability, again, adds for a lot of, how we call it, added value in this space. If we know where it comes from, like we said, from farm to fork, from seed to shelf, whatever. So the, the authenticity, what, what are your thoughts on, on proving authenticity on top of traceability? Is that not a tremendous value driver for a lot of people who that now want traceability because of the authenticity? Uh, it is for sure, like I think that was Joachim Schwerin for DigiGrow, the one that is always making that argument in his panels and like all the fake products are, in, are entering into the European market and how they are actually like impact on the European economy because of that. Um, I think the digital product passport is actually one of the solutions uh, and it's like being like digital product passports are being like deployed and like kind of like explore for different companies. You're exploring one, we have the EPSI project where we are actually trying to do also the digital product passport for the European blockchain infrastructure. So I think that this is actually how we are going to solve that. Like, I don't know. What are your thoughts, uh, Catherine? Um, I think apart from what we just talked about, the product passport and stuff, um, it's very, very important for the whole carbon credit market, um, which is an entire other marketplace and I'm not really, um, deep into it, um, but I know uh, the consortiums around it, a lot of startups around it, um, and that's and they, they care about like the whole carbon offset topic um, and its authenticity um, about do they really I don't know plant a tree or do they do those carbon credits really exist stuff like this, um, and on top I've talked about it um, in my. Um, speech before, uh, what we do with uh, Siemens uh, about the verifiable credentials. So is the one I think I'm talking to really the one I think I'm talking to. And um, I should add like in some industries, like uh, I'm always moving into the communication <laughs> from carbon credit. <laughs> so um, um, in some industries, for example, like fashion, some, some luxury goods, um, this uh, kind of uh, authenticity and this like kind of digital ID, the, the product password things are giving uh, a second life to products uh, in an easier way that also people can consume that product with this assurance that they know, okay, uh, when and how this product has been turned around the market. So I, I really like the concept. And I should say, like, we should uh, g uh, ask you, Pasquale, the same question, because I know you're also doing something great in this in this segment. Um, so maybe you can. Yeah, so, so again, I, I think the what we call the authenticity of things is is, is extremely important. So we, we will look, I look at, you know, not from a QR code or from whatever a blockchain point of view, but again, from the, from the journey and then invisibly marking things and then by an invisible marker, all of a sudden, you know, create that, that digital passport. And, and you touched upon uh, obviously carbon credits and, and that's obviously is, is one of my, I'd say my, my, I almost say my passion, right? Because I, I think again, and I shared this before, um, that market is so full of shit, you won't believe it. Um, but again, 
if you, you can say, okay, this is a problem, and everybody talks about it, even discussions I had today with some of the people, yeah, it's all the garbage in and garbage out, blah, blah, blah. But ultimately, again, which why I love our space so much, right, Web3 and blockchain, is that we do have the ability to be that the salt of the, of the world. The salt always gives taste, right? Salt, when you apply salt to something, it changes, and salt, that, that kind of the, the acronym of SALT, applying standardization, accessibility, liquidity, and transparency and trust. So that kind of thinking within this space, like I think we all would, would agree on, that SALT thinking is where we will make, I know 100% will make the difference. Um, I'm gonna play the devil's advocate because SALT also dehydrates. And I think that there is like main component here that we tend to forget and it's like, Behind all of these solutions, there is people. And when we talk about like authenticity, I think that in your speech you talk about like medicines. I'm from Colombia, so like I know how countries with developing economies sometimes works, and we have like sometimes like less protection coming from the governments or from the regulatory perspective. So when you actually like have medicines that are fake or they were alterated, and you don't have digital product passports they probably don't enter in Europe. They ended in, uh, in, in countries in the global south. And actually what these kind of solutions can help us to do is actually to ensure that like people in the global south has the same quality products that we have in the global north. And in that way we are also protecting human rights. So like when we talk also like about like supply chain and who get impacted, it's not only the farmers that are producing, it's like, like people that doesn't have the money to actually like pay the products more expensive because the supply chain got alterated and therefore more expensive. So I actually like think that like, and I'm happy to see that like in the IOTA Foundation and our community at least like, the human component has always been part of the vision because it's basically, we always need to think for whom are we designing this? And not, it's not only the market, it's like who is going to get impacted and who are the humans behind this? 100% agrees, and I think in closing, that, that is the most important thought, right? It's, it's humans, we're serving, we're empowering humans at the end of the day by the solutions we spoke about, the problems that we're solving. I, I wanna thank you all very much. Our, our time thank is up. You. Mina, thank you so much. Thank as you. Well, Catherine and Mariana, we, we had a, a lovely discussion. I hope you enjoyed it um, as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.